What up, viewers? Remember that infamous feminist glaciology paper? Well, I'm going to read it. The whole thing. Cover to cover, first word to last. Abstract, intro, discussion, and conclusion. The whole thing. And along the way, I'm going to give my commentary as a skeptic and a geologist, and I'm going to take apart some of the more ridiculous claims in it. This is going to be a series, since this is a rather long paper. Today I'll cover just the abstract and the introduction. So without further ado, let's get started with Glasses, Gender and Science, a feminist glaciology framework for global environmental change research. I fail to see how the advocacy of the social, political and economic status of women has any conceivable thing to do with global environmental change research, but I'm free to be proven wrong. This was written by Mark Carey, M. Jackson, Alessandro Antonello and Jacqueline Rushing of the University of Oregon, USA. I'm going to avoid that place like the plague. Abstract. Glaciers are key icons of climate change and global environmental change. However, relationships among gender, science and glaciers, particularly related to epistemological questions about the production of glaciological knowledge, remain understudied. Hmm. I wonder why that is. This paper thus proposes a feminist glaciology framework with four key components. One, knowledge producers. What the fuck is a knowledge producer? Two, gendered science and knowledge. Three, systems of scientific domination. And four, alternative representations of glaciers. I'm struggling to imagine how you could represent a glacier as anything other than, well, a fucking glacier. I assume you're borrowing this representation business from the feminist concept of representations of women in media, movies, video games, etc. And how they use it to complain about sexual objectification. But here's the thing. Nobody is sexually objectifying a glacier. Nobody wants to fuck a glacier. Well, I'm sure there's probably someone out there who gets his kicks out of, you know, sticking his dick inside a glacial crevasse or some shit. So going on about the objectification of glaciers is just pointless. Merging feminist postcolonial science studies and feminist political ecology, the feminist glaciology framework generates robust analyses of gender, power and epistemologies in dynamic social ecological systems, thereby leading to more just and equitable science and human ice interactions. Marvellous, can't wait. A bunch of keywords, including, bizarrely, folk glaciology. Is that a thing? Can folk beliefs about glaciers even be counted as glaciology? The fact that they aren't structured on a scientific basis seems to strongly indicate that they can't. But moreover, is this some sort of postmodernist cultural relativism coming in here? Like, it's a logocentrist imperialist assumption that glaciology is the only legitimate way of interpreting glaciers. We should consider alternative and equally valid viewpoints, despite the fact that they are worth nothing, have contributed nothing, and can predict nothing. Jesus, I mean, do these people even know why so much trust and emphasis is placed in scientific explanations for things? 1. Introduction Glaciers are icons of global climate change with common representations stripping them of social and cultural context to portray ice as simplified climate change yardsticks and thermometers. How is the interpretation that glaciers are sensitive to average winter temperature dependent on culture? I mean, sure, different cultures use different explanatory frameworks, and I concede that these often yield radically different results. But as I mentioned previously, only the scientific interpretation of glaciers has in practice been of any utility. And furthermore, the very process of generating scientific knowledge, as you would probably put it, is independent of culture. Anyone from any background can make valid interpretations about the natural world as long as they follow the scientific method. Recall that this is the development of hypotheses, the testing of these hypotheses with the intent to disprove them, the collection and interpretation of these results, subjecting those results to the scrutiny of others, leading to either acceptance or rejection of the interpretation, and over time, preponderance of evidence either lends more weight or more discredit to the interpretation. How does culture factor into that in any capacity? The only two ways I can conceive of it doing so is if the author is forced to make a certain interpretation by their culture, which may or may not be valid, or if the peer review process is biased in favour of the customs of a particular culture, both of which aren't meant to happen. The whole idea of peer review is that biases can be eliminated, now sure, peer review is often imperfect, since reviewers don't work in a vacuum and often have biases of their own, particularly if they are engaging in groupthink, but this is not guaranteed in principle. It's just a problem that occasionally arises in practice. Also, note that the observation that glaciers are sensitive to temperature is not dependent on culture, and to suggest that it is would be freaking retarded. 
Reality does not bend to the whims of the pathetic mortal humans that inhabit it. Deal with it. Moving on. In geophysicist Henry Pollock's articulation, ICE asks no questions, presents no arguments, reads no newspapers, listens to no debates, it is not burdened by ideology and carries no political baggage as it crosses the threshold from solid to liquid. It just melts. Couldn't have said it better myself. This perspective appears consistently in public discourse, from media to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. But the ice is just ice conceptualization contrasts sharply with conclusions by researchers such as Cruikshank, 2005, who asks if glaciers listen. What? Or Levertel, 2008, who analysed the cultural farming of glaciers. Carey, 2007, who sees an endangered species narrative applied to glaciers. Jackson, 2015, who exposes how glaciers are depicted as ruins. And Sorlin, 2015 who refers to the present as the cryo-historical moment, because ice has become historical, that is, the ice is an element of change and thus something that can be considered as part of society and of societal concern. Yeah, yeah, okay, some pseudo-poetic descriptions of attitudes people have about glaciers, fine, whatever, but glaciers can listen! What is that citation? Kruikshank J, 2005. Do glaciers listen? Local knowledge, colonial encounters, and social imagination. Alright, so some relativist fuckwad claiming that some Native Americans being like Great Ice Cliff speak truth or some shit is just as valid as the evil Western imperialist scientific approach. Wow, what utter horseshit. Just because the correct explanation for something comes from a culture you do not like does not spontaneously make it invalid. And likewise, just because some poor oppressed indigenous people have some superstitious belief about glaciers, that is not just as valid because that culture is oppressed. Way to downplay Native American culture, by the way. The oppressed versus oppressor dichotomy is fucking irrelevant when it comes to questions of scientific relevance. One interpretation is right, and the other is wrong. Simple as that. And that's not evil Western logocentrism talking. That's reality. That's the observations derived from reality that disagree with this stupid superstitious nonsense about listening glaciers. Noosa and Bagel, 2014, also reject the ice is just ice assertion. Glaciers, they argue, have increasingly become contested and controversial objects of knowledge, susceptible to cultural farmings as both dangerous and endangered landscapes. Oh my god, the point Pollock made just went right over your head, didn't it? He wasn't claiming that there's only one valid way to interpret glaciers. It appears as though he was criticising some climate change denier by citing the melting of glaciers as irrefutable evidence of climate change. But you used this cherry-picked quote to go on about contested objects of knowledge and cultural farming. What in the fuck? By cultural farming, I assume you're not actually referring to the practice of using chemical substances to enhance crop and livestock health and prevent diseases and pest infestations, which is the closest definition I could find, and that is instead some metaphor for interpretations of glaciers by people in a particular culture? You're not exactly making this easy for me, are you? Glaciers, after all, affect people worldwide by influencing sea level. Wrong! Glaciers are bodies of ice with a limited extent that develop on mountains or on the edges of continents where snow builds up until it transforms into ice, which behaves as a non-Newtonian fluid and flows away. Sea level is controlled by the melting and freezing of ice sheets, which are accumulations of ice that extend over large distances, sometimes over entire continents, as on Antarctica and Greenland. I get the point you made, and this is nitpicking, but this is an academic paper, published in a respected, or increasingly less respected, journal. You should know better. Providing water for drinking and agriculture, generating hydroelectric energy from glacier runoff, triggering natural disasters, Yielding rich climate data from ice cores. Again, these are not taken from glaciers. In order to obtain an ice core, you need a continuous record of ice deposition. This is not possible on glaciers since, well, they flow. And this means that the record of ice as a core is taken down is not continuous. I mean, it may be possible, but it would require a very careful interpretation and it would need to be made very clear what was done and why. Ice flowage also occurs around the edge of large ice sheets. So long ice cores like the Epica or Vostok cores are intentionally taken from the very centre of ice sheets where this effect is minimised. Shaping religious beliefs and cultural values, constituting identities. I sexually identify as a glacier. 
Ever since I was a boy, I dreamed of slowly accumulating on some alpine mountain and gradually flowing into the valleys. People say to me that a person being a glacier is impossible and I'm fucking retarded, but I don't care. I'm beautiful. I'm having a plastic surgeon install fern deposits, crevasses, and lateral and terminal moraines on my body. From now on, I want you guys to call me Vatna Yokul and respect my right to slowly carve U-shaped valleys and deposit glacial drop stones. If you can't accept me, you're a glacier phobe and need to check your landform privilege. Thank you for being so understanding. Inspiring art and literature and driving tourist economies that affect local populations and travellers alike. Despite their perceived remoteness, glaciers are central sites, the fuck, often contested and multifaceted, experiencing the effects of global change, where science, policy, knowledge and society interact in dynamic social ecological systems. That's just fucking gibberish. I mean, what was the point of that? You just wasted my time. Fuck you. Today, there is a need for a much more profound analysis of societies living in and engaging with mountains and cold regions, including the social, economic, political, cultural, epistemological, and religious aspects of glaciers. While I can understand how the retreat of glaciers as a result of climate change may result in changes to the lifestyle of indigenous peoples, but why would the religious aspect of that be of any concern? If you worship a glacier as some sort of divine object, then, well... There's not much I can do to help you. A critical, but overlooked, understatement of the century aspect of the human dimensions of glaciers and global change research is the relationship between gender and glaciers. While there has been relatively little research on gender and global environmental change in general, if that is the case, then right off the bat, this paper is severely handicapped, as if it wasn't already. If the general sphere of knowledge you're working in is underdeveloped, specialising into a minute aspect of that is inherently counterproductive. This is how academia works. The area of study needs to be sufficiently mature that its benefits and limitations can be accurately assessed before it is applied in specific circumstances. Here, for example, it needs to be proven that the field of gender and environmental change research is not a fucking fairy tale and can actually generate useful results that can be applied to the real world. Then you can talk about feminist glaciology, if it suits you. The way this is written just makes it look like you have no case to present and just want the opportunity to ramble on and on, spewing forth an utter word salad of a paper that you can get into a journal to make a quick buck off the taxpayer funds that are being spent putting this utter trite in university libraries, you frauds! There is even less from a feminist perspective that focuses on gender, understood here not as a male-female binary, but as a range of personal and social responsibilities. Oh, and of course, here comes the pseudoscience. There is no such thing as a gender spectrum. Okay, now before all the butter SJWs watching this report this video for transphobia, I think it's worth stating that the minority of people who are trans do not wish to be some third gender, or some male-female gender hybrid, or some other crap. They just want to be the opposite gender to the one they were born as, which is absolutely fine by the way. The minority of that minority who do believe they are on some sort of gender spectrum or whatever are ideologically driven special snowflakes who can frankly go fuck themselves. Nor does the existence of transgender people disprove the reality of there being two genders. 0.3% of the population is transgender, it is the exception and not the rule. Moving on. And also on power justice, inequality, and knowledge production in the context of ice, glacier change, and glaciology. Exceptions. Huh? People have studied this before? Umetal, 2008. Williams and Golovnev, 2015. Hevely, 1996. Holbertal, 2010. Kirkshank, 2005. Feminist theories and critical epistemologies, especially feminist political ecology and feminist postcolonial science studies, open up new perspectives and analyses of the history of glaciological knowledge. No, no thank you. I pass on the feminism. That complements glaciology like cheese complements Chinese food. Researchers in feminist political ecology and feminist geography, for example, Sultana, 2014, Mollett and Farrier, 2013, Elmhurst, 2011, Coddington, 2015, have also called for studies to move beyond gender to include analyses of power, justice and knowledge production, Okay, I've fucking had enough. I've got to find out what they mean by knowledge producer, because I'm sure by now that they're referring to something specific. Googling knowledge producer initially leads me to some sort of rap band. I assume that's not what they're referring to. A more precise search leads me to this, from the California State University. 
It's about some doctoral training program. That can't be it. At this point, I started to lose hope. This supposedly well-defined, jokes aside, it probably isn't, concept seems not to even be mentioned anywhere. Am I missing something? But lo, who approacheth? Science as a whole is a product of Western modernity and the whole thing should be scratched off. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's that bigoted self-righteous dimwit who claimed that science is a tool of the white devil and needs to be torn down and replaced with fucking black magic. There's a, a place uh, in Kezer, in Mkabiyalingana, and they believe that through uh, the magic, the black magic, they call it black magic, they call it witchcraft, others, that you are able to send a lightning to strike someone. So can you explain that scientifically? Because it's if it's something that happens, it's <laughs> Honestly, I find this attitude fucking cancerous. But I digress. She defines knowledge producer for us. I, from a decolonized perspective, believe we can do more as new knowledge producers, as people who are given the ability to reason or whatever. So a knowledge producer is someone with the ability to reason or whatever. OK, well, if a knowledge producer can be succinctly defined as having the ability to reason, why are the authors of this paper claiming that glaciers are knowledge producers? Glaciers cannot reason. They aren't even fucking alive. Now, I know from reading this that these authors are biased and ideologically mired to the point of perversity, but I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and assume they're not that insane as to suggest that glaciers themselves are capable of reason. But given that earlier the science of glaciology was briefly touched on, I think what they mean when they say a glacier is a knowledge producer, knowledge. what they mean is that the glaciologists studying the glacier are producing knowledge by reasoning about the glacier, in which case they are the knowledge producers, not the glacier, as stated. God, this paper is so sloppily written. I was sent on an internet wild goose chase all because of you. I'm honestly surprised this passed peer review. I would have told them to go away and refine their wording so it's actually consistent. And throw away the entire paper because it is fucking useless bullshit! As well as to unsettle and challenge dominant assumptions that are often embedded in Eurocentric knowledges. What inherent assumptions are embedded in Eurocentric knowledge? Given the prominent place of glasses within both the social imaginary of climate change, by imaginary are you implying that the reality of climate change depends on culture? because that would be freaking retarded. A feminist approach has important present-day relevance for understanding the dynamic relationship between people and ice, what Nusser and Bagel refer to as the cryoscape. Uh, what? By dynamic relationship, I assume you're not literally implying some sort of physical process, which was the first thing that came to mind, because that would be fucking mental, and are instead referring to something cultural, since that appears to be what you're obsessed with, given that you are very clearly a cultural relativist. So is there a dynamic relationship between glaciers and human culture? Well, I guess that human culture is influenced by the presence of glaciers. For example, if a primitive superstitious people came across a glacier, they would probably explain it with reference to the supernatural, which could in turn develop into a religious dogma. That certainly has the potential to shape culture and human identity, to an extent. But as for a scientifically advanced 21st century civilization, I somewhat doubt that this is the case. Our culture is influenced by far more powerful things than the presence or absence of glaciers. Glaciers are often portrayed as proof of anthropogenic climate change, leading to increased glacial melting, but that hasn't affected our entire culture. It has just convinced more people that climate change is a real thing. But furthermore, what does this have to do with feminism? I think it's worth pointing out that we've come this far in the paper without as much as a single elaboration of feminism in anything other than the abstract. I know that this is still just the introduction and the whole point of that is to introduce the subject at hand, but from what I've seen so far, this paper seems to have less to do with feminism than it has to do with cultural relativism. You've gone into some detail upon the dominant assumptions embedded in Western Eurocentric knowledges and how perspectives from other indigenous cultures need to be given equal time, but that has nothing to do with gender, unless you're invoking intersectionality here, which actually makes sense. This, however, does not stand up to even basic scrutiny. Find me any evidence that women share camaraderie with indigenous peoples simply because they are both oppressed by some nebulous oppressor. Probably white men. You're not going to, are you? Great! So this is just wild speculation that can be dismissed out of hand, and therefore renders this entire paper redundant. Through a review and synthesis of a multidisciplinary and wide-ranging literature on human-ice relations, 
This paper proposes a feminist glaciology framework to analyse human glacier dynamics, glacier narratives and discourse, and claims the credibility and authority of glaciological knowledge through the lens of feminist studies. The only authority glaciological knowledge, as you put it, has is that it explains the evidence of how glaciers behave. If an alternative model was proposed that was more coherent and explained the evidence better, that would take the place of the previous theory and inherit its authority. By the way, typical of you to phrase everything in terms of power and authority. This paper, however, is not that theory. As a point of departure, we use glaciology as an encompassing sense that exceeds the immediate scientific meanings of the label, much as feminist critiques of geography, for example, have expanded what it is that geography might mean via vi geographic knowledge. Nice one! Redefine what glaciology means so you don't have to address the scientific theory, which you might even think is completely 100% legit, so you can waffle on and on about how all ideas are equally valid and no culture is superior and how knowledge is relative, and you get to call this postmodernist codswallop up glaciology, despite having put in none of the efforts that an actual fucking glaciologist has to, to formulate and test a scientific theory, yet alone get it into a peer-reviewed journal. Classy! Getting academic accolades by doing no hard work whatsoever and instead leeching off and appropriating their respect of actual scientists! You are cancer! As such, feminist glaciology has four aspects. One, knowledge producers. To decipher how gender affects the individuals producing glacier-related knowledges, yes, of course, because we all know that the ability to reason is affected by the presence or absence of a cock, you sexist fuck. 2. Gendered science and knowledge, to address how glacier science, perceptions, and claims to credibility are gendered. Find me any example where overtly gendered language is used in any scientific literature, and I might take this point marginally seriously. 3. Systems of scientific domination. Oh my god! God, no! Science is the process of explaining the natural world by use of reason and interpretation of physical data to develop models with predictive capability. How the fuck is that in any way a system of domination? Honestly, you people are fucking nuts! Can't you even for a second? A single solitary second! Not see the world in terms of power and domination! You need professional help! To analyse how power, domination, colonialism, and control, undergridded by and consistent with masculinist ideologies, of course, because men are Satan, am I right? Long ago, everything was well and peaceful and in harmony, with no oppression to be seen, and then men came along and fucked everything up with their science and their masculinist ideologies. The world was never the same again. Have shaped glacier-related sciences and knowledges over time, and four, alternative representations to illustrate diverse methods and ways beyond the natural sciences and including what we refer to as folk glaciologies to portray glaciers and integrate counter narratives into broader conceptions of the cryosphere. So let me get this straight. Because science is imperialistic and dominating, which it isn't, and a patriarchal tool used by men for the domination of women and in indigenous cultures, which it isn't, it must be sidelined and replaced with folk beliefs, regardless of how accurate its theories are and how much predictive capability they have. Brilliant. Let's just dismiss medicine while we're at it and replace it with homeopathy, because at least it's not imperialistic and dominating. In fact, the authors of this piece would like to demonstrate that fact by being the first three people to be cured of terminal cancer by each drinking three litres of infinitesimally diluted horse shit. These four components of feminist glaciology not only help to critically uncover the under-examined history of glaciological knowledge and glacier-related sciences predominant in today's climate change discussions, the framework also has important implications for understanding vulnerability, adaptation and resilience, all central themes in global environmental change research and decision-making that have lacked such robust analyses of epistemologies and knowledge production. No, actually, I think you mean this entire concept of feminist glaciology is useless postmodernist gibberish. It has precisely no use or application in climate change discussions or environmental science, or indeed anything for that matter. It's just you appropriating the terminology of an actual science in order to both undermine the use of science and further your relativist ideology. I've got to say I'm disappointed at the apparent paucity of actual feminism in this piece so far, 
At this point, the predominant thrust of your arguments appears to be bog-standard cultural relativism. Traditional glaciology, being Western, is inherently limited and based on the unfounded assumption that reality exists and can be measured, and therefore needs to take a back seat to allow other explanatory frameworks a fair hearing, especially those for native cultures since the West is white and therefore evil, and if these poor, helpless, oppressed cultures have their own explanation, it must, by default, be correct. I've got to be honest, this line of thought is just infantile. Two people expressing concepts of truth with equal passion but which contradict each other, evidence notwithstanding. Well, they're both right. Everyone is happy. We can't go telling people that they're wrong, can't we? That would be mean. Participation ribbons for everyone. But furthermore, if we were to accept that truth claims are relative and depend upon culture, that undermines making any truth claim whatsoever since any truth claim can be extrapolated across the entirety of possible instances where it applies, pretty much by definition. The same applies to moral relativism. If we accept that all moral frameworks are equally valid, then making any moral argument fails by default before it's even made, since the whole point of making a moral statement is for it to apply in all circumstances. Or do you think it's okay that the Aztecs sacrificed humans by the thousand to appease their gods, that Afghans sexually abuse children in weird cross-dressing rituals, and that the Saudis behead homosexuals? They're all claimed to be perfectly moral by the people who practice or have practiced them. What I also find interesting here is you make frequent references to how knowledge is used to exert power over others, and it is therefore obvious that you've been influenced by the work of Michel Foucault. I might make a video looking into his theory of knowledge at some point as a supplement to this series on feminist glaciology. And speaking of the video series, I think this instalment has gone on long enough and I'll end it here. Part 2 will cover the next section of the paper. Now before I sign off, I would like to apologise for the shitty quality of my previous video. That was mostly an experiment with the sort of low effort, off the cuff style of video that people like V specialise in. I really don't think it turned out well and I'll stick to more researched and production heavy videos like this one in future. That does mean however that they will be uploaded less frequently so don't expect a regular schedule. I will aim to upload at least once a month though. Rest assured I'm still around and haven't died in a tragic lawnmower accident. I just have a load of IRL stuff to be going on with as well. Also, I will still upload this to Minds as well as YouTube. My fretting about switching solely to Minds was in the thick of the YouTube monetization crisis, and although ad rates are still abysmal, I decided I might as well continue to upload videos onto YouTube. I mean, if I'm doing this just for the money, or for the potential of making money since I haven't actually monetized any of my shit yet, then what's the point? For now, I'm just doing this because I like it. And I feel that the relativist postmodernist nonsense that has infested humanities academia, and as can be clearly seen, is now pushing its tendrils into science academia, has had a deplorable influence on the political left and needs to be challenged. Anyway, enough has been said. Stay tuned, please rate, comment, subscribe if you can't get enough of me, share if you want to shill me, and expect a new video sometime soon. Thanks for watching. Hmm, 670 views, but 100% approval, so obviously a hidden gem. One comment, I love you, daddy.